I'm so pleased that we are able to, um, int to introduce Dr. Jonathan Scott Holloway from Yale University. He currently serves as Dean of Yale College and is a professor of African American Studies, History, and American Studies, which I'm sure keeps him very busy. Um, he has held fellowships at numerous uh, distinguished institutions such as Harvard, Stanford, and the Ford Foundation. He has uh, specialized in post-emancipation United States history with a focus on social and intellectual history. His, off his books have uh, looked at the intellectual development of African American intellectual thought during the early 20th century. And his most recent book, Jim Crow Wisdom, Memory and Identity in Black America Since 1940, has won um, a prestigious book award from the Before Columbus Foundation. Uh, in all of his work, um, Dr. Holloway is uh, certainly one of the finest scholars in African American history um, that I've had the pleasure of meeting. And he is engaged actively with um, important questions about who we are as Americans and who gets to be included in that, uh, in that definition. And so if you please wel help me welcome him with a very warm um, applause. Thank you. What I want to do this evening is offer some framing thoughts um, for this conversation, but then, then do a reading from my, my book. And, and I'll leave plenty of time for questions, um, but there are some caveats you should know in advance to understand what I'm sort of trying to do in the talk and what I try to do in the book. The book is about a struggle between understanding what memory is, what its value is, and what history is. And I'm trained as a historian, but the more I got into this project, um, the more, well, I was planning to write it as a third person omniscient book, like historians do, we never use the first person. But the more I got into this project, the more I could not resist the fact that the narrative I was trying to craft, third person omniscient, from uh, 1940 or so to the present, kept intersecting with my family history, or really vice versa. My family history kept intersecting with that. And finally, I gave myself permission after being stuck for a couple of years, uh, truly being stuck, because I couldn't find a way to get my family history out of the history I was writing. So I finally said, heck, I'm going to put it in. So you will hear in this reading I'm going to offer um, abrupt transitions between first and third person. It's not because I've edited things out. They are actually there intentionally. And I'm very happy to talk about that at the end of, in, end of the conversation. But I don't want to say any more. I just wanted to give you a heads up as you're wondering, like, what the heck is he doing? Um, I'm doing it on purpose. So let me begin with a series of questions and some quick commentary before I get into what is a reading from the book. The title, of course, is what, Whose Memories Matter? race, identity, and the battle for American history. But I want to broaden this out, the scope of inquiry, out further for the first just a few minutes of the conversation. Whose memories matter? What makes an empire? The image you're seeing here is an image of Elihu Yale, the person for whom Yale University is named, a British merchant who never came to colonial North America, but who donated 12 crates of books, several tradable goods. As I said, he was a merchant. He gave them to the ministers who were establishing a school that turns out to be named in his honor, um, Yale University. Well, in one of the art collections at Yale is this painting of Elihu Yale, surrounded by several other lords and some ladies or young girls in waiting in the background. This past fall at the Yale Center for British Art, which has, holds this painting and several others of Elihu Yale, the curators mounted an exhibit called Figures of Empire in which they took all of their, their, their went through all of their collection looking at um, these different portrait, landscapes or portraits of British art. Uh, they can't collect anything past 1900, I believe. So a lot of the art looks like this. And they wanted to find other subjects and they discovered to their surprise that there are over 300 pieces of art in their collection in which there was a black subject. So my interest in this image is not these gentlemen here or these ladies there, but this figure here. 
is not just that you see a page dressed in finery. It's not that you see a page, you see a servant. It's not that you see a servant. Around his neck is not a ruffled collar, but a metal collar with a lock. You're seeing a slave. Now, we, don't know, we know the name of everybody in the foreground. We don't know the names of the women in the background. And we don't know his name. We don't know if he actually even existed. In Figures of Empire, these paintings that explore the figures who are to the side of the image, they are openly asking, what makes an empire? And these lords, quite liter literally these lords, representationally would often have slaves off to the side or in the background, because that represented what made them. This image to the side signaled who they were, in addition to everything else you see in the painting. What makes an empire? What makes a people? This is an image from Elmina Castle on the Ghanaian coast. And you're seeing here within this walled courtyard the church for Portuguese soldiers, the slave castles on the Ghanaian coast, castles and fortresses, about 80 of them at the height of the slave trade, before the slave trade. These were warehouses for cloth, gold, you know, tradable items, many of which Elihu Yale was trading himself. They're storehouses, and then they discovered the great wealth in human bodies, and they became dungeons. Because these places were so valuable, they held some such valuable things, they had to have a garrison troops there to protect what was inside. But the troops, being good Christians, had to have a place to worship. They could not worship safely outside the walls. So the chapels built inside the courtyard. What makes a people? If you follow my mouse, here's the entrance to the chapel. If you walk across the courtyard, about 15 yards, 20 yards, is a door, and over that door is this, skull and crossbones. It's a punishment chamber. There's one for soldiers who had gotten drunk or out of control. They bake a drunk tank that had a window in the door and a window in the wall, and one or two soldiers would stay there until they sobered up. But the punishment chamber was for those Africans who fought against the idea of them being slaves. There were no windows in this chamber. The room was, I would say, about 10 by 20 feet. And they would bring 30 Africans in who refused to be slaves, chained together, and lock them there until they died. Wouldn't take very long, given the environment. They dragged the bodies out into the courtyard to demonstrate or exercise complete control. What makes a people? Who are our heroes? If you go to Barbados, and actually throughout the Caribbean, but this is an example from Barbados, only in the last 20 or 30 years, and really much more recently for most of the British-speaking Caribbean, this is, what I'm, this is what I know, what I'm learning, only in the last 10 to 20 years are citizens of these countries being willing to talk about the enslaved past. And this is specifically with Barbados. I was there for uh, several days, and they only talked about workers. Even on sugarcane plantations, they would talk about workers, never about slaves. In their hall next to Parliament, or their Hall of National Heroes, there would be people of African descent represented, the great cricketer, the great um, uh, labor leader, uh, the first black prime minister of Barbados. Impressive people, no doubt. Only one mention of an enslaved person. This is a representation. We don't know what he looked like of a slave named Bussa, who led the only slave uprising, the only one they talk about, at least, in Barbados. He didn't survive it. No real surprise there. But it's become a figure in um, post-colonial Barbados of possibility. The chains are broken. Of course, he didn't live to see his chains broken, in a sense. He died once he broke his own chains. What makes an empire? What makes a people? Who are our heroes? Again, Bussa being the only person who is enslaved in the National Hall of Heroes in Barbados. And then bringing the Atlantic world closer to home, to the US, where I'll focus my energy for the rest of the talk. What narratives 
do we consume about who we are? This is yours truly with a regrettably long haircut. For anybody who's been to Colonial Williamsburg, you'll know exactly where I am. This is a tourist must stop. You go to the stockade and you take this picture and it's fun and you know, ha ha, and this is a great thing. Well, this is taken in 1976. I was in fourth grade. I was not, despite my Afro, any sort of racial militant. Um, I was just a fourth grader with a lot of hair that made my parents upset. Um, and I noticed, though, over the course of the three-day trip, when you lived in the D.C. area, you spent three days down in Yorkside, Williamsburg. It's just what you did in fourth grade there. Um, actually, I can't look at that any longer. Um, the, um, <laughs> you, you go down to Yorkside in Williamsburg, and in 1976, you, if you're 12 years old, no, no, uh, 10 years old, Jonathan Holloway, you walk around, and you notice after a few days, growing up in the D.C. area where you see black people all the time, you happen to be black yourself, you just, this is something you know, that there are no black people in Williamsburg in terms of the people in costume. Well, fast, what you don't know is behind the scenes, curators are beginning to really think about how to change representational politics and that within a little while you're gonna see actually slave auctions, very controversial in Colonial Williamsburg. But this is a national shrine that helps define who we are as a people. Williamsburg, it's it is truly impressive, I say without irony. But we consume that as a tourist, right? But even the 10-year-old Jonathan Holloway is wondering, where are the black people? Aren't there, shouldn't there be more black people? The scholar Jonathan Holloway knows that half of Williamsburg and during this era was, was African, half of it. And we now know a lot more about those people than we did before. But still, people fought very hard against representations of black life in Colonial Williamsburg. They don't like the story of slavery because it tells us something about who we are as a people and what we consume. What makes a nation or an empire? What makes a people? Who are our heroes? What narratives do we consume? I'm going to go into the reading right now, talking about museums, places of consumption and of articulation of heroes and of nations and of peoplehood. Making a museum, Memphis. The sky was spotless as I made my way through what seemed to be a gentrifying arts district of Memphis. I wasn't far from my destination, but I already was finding it difficult to imagine a different era, since it was clear that so much of, had been cleaned up in the last handful of years. Even the trolley trun trundling past didn't look authentically old, since it was so clearly new. The place even verged on being antiseptic. The sidewalk seemed devoid of any foot traffic. Granted, it was a mid-morning weekday in late summer, it, is, it was hot. Uh, it is likely the neighborhood's character changed in the evening when the bistros and restaurants began to fill up for happy hours, and then again on the weekend when the city's farmer market, uh, located just around the corner, opened for business. I wasn't there, however, to go on a pub crawl or shop for local produce. Where was the museum? I should be close by. And then one block down, I saw it. Not the museum, but the hotel. Now, for those who study the African-American past, and likely for most people who pay even the slightest bit of attention during Black History Month or in their high school social studies units, you could not help but notice the sign. It seems silly to say, but it looked just like it did in the photographs. Granted, there wasn't a crowd of men frozen on the balcony pointing across the street to where James O. Ray fired his rifle, but they didn't need to be there to get the effect of the moment. I literally gasped, and my stomach dropped. This is the Lorraine Hotel. Of course, the museum was also the hotel, but the stagecraft of the museum was such, even the vehicles parked immediately outside in front of the hotel were vintage vehicles similar to those that would have been there when Martin Luther King was shot. The stagecraft of the museum was such that when you pulled up to the front of the museum, the only thing you could process was the fact that you were staring at the hotel where King spent his final moments, the hotel from all of the textbooks and documentaries, the hotel you knew even though you had never before stepped foot in the hotel, much less Memphis. Opened in the 1920s as the Windsor Hotel, the building was purchased and renamed by Walter and Larie Bailey in 1945. The Lorraine Hotel, 
became known for its high profile guests who were performing a block away on Beale Street, the heart of Memphis's black community, and the incubator of so many of the country's blues performers. After the shock of King's murder, and literally it was a shock, as co-owner Louis Bailey died of a heart attack after running out into the parking lot and seeing King had been shot. After the shock of King's murder, the subsequent years of urban decline, and then a post-segregated renewal that meant that black visitors could stay in other more modern facilities, the Lorraine faced foreclosure in 1982. It had become at that point a long-term high, excuse me, a long-term low-income apartment complex when local activists and business leaders came together to purchase the space at auction with the intention of turning it into a civil rights museum. The museum opened to the public in September 1991. And I must say, since I wrote this, the museum actually went through renovation and reopened to the public just in the last year or two. I've not been there. The museum is much more than a tri tribute to the civil rights movement's greatest leader. It aims to present a richly historical narrative of what historians now call the long civil rights movement. The museum's curators follow a straightforward chronological narrative, but they stretch the boundaries of the movement far beyond its typical start in the mid-1950s. By plotting great triumphs in the civil rights struggle along a 400-year timeline, and by pointing out that slave revolts in the 1600s were nothing if not battles for civil rights, the exhibits force visitors to reimagine fam the familiar terrain of civil rights. The familiar is still there, however, as visitors see authentic Ku Klux Klan robes, sit in the kind of bus um, that black Montgomerians boycotted for over a year, and walk past a replica of the Birmingham jail where King pinned one of the great documents in the American canon. As they pass by other exhibits that share the history of other less well-known moments in modern civil rights history, visitors may be unaware that they are slowly but steadily moving up a gently sloping si uh, walkway, until, that is, they turn a corner and are bathed in the natural light from the windows that overlook the second floor balcony where King was shot. The museum effectively pulls you into the small space by having you walk between two hotel rooms restored to how they appeared in April 1968 when King was there. Tourists who originally saw the iconic hotel and then immersed themselves in the museum experience for over an hour are whip whipsawed back to the fact that they are in the hotel, mere feet from where King slept on April 3rd, mere feet in a different direction from where he collapsed on April 4th. It is a very quiet space, even when it is crowded. The final exhibit space in the museum is across the street and brings the visitor to the spot where James Earl Ray spied King through his rifle's uh, sight and pulled the trigger. Although theatrical in its clear attempt to broker an emotional response, it is hard to find fault with the effectiveness of the curator's decision to recreate these scenes in this progression. Here in the course of two hours or so, visitors receive a very thorough recounting of an expansive civil rights narrative and experience the emotional trauma of bearing witness to a great tragedy. But the curator's efforts to create, recreate a scene of horror so that visitors could make a deeper visceral connection to the site and to the history was not met with universal praise. Jacqueline Smith, a longtime resident of the Lorraine uh, when it had become a low-income boarding house, refused to leave the building when it was sold and being prepared for the renovation that would convert it into the museum. Smith stayed in her room after other residents moved out. After the court order declared she needed to vacate, and after her water and heat were turned off. Finally, on March 2nd, 1988, two months into her, into her illegal occupancy, four Shelby County deputies forced open the door to her room and carried her and her belongings out to the curb. When she first announced in January that she would not leave despite the court order, Smith said that, quote, Dr. King would have wanted me to stay here. He said he didn't want any memorial, but he wanted to help the poor. On the morning of her eviction, a sobbing Smith declared that she had no place to go. This is wrong. You people, you people are making a mistake. Smith sat on the sidewalk among her belongings and refused to leave. Over two years later, Smith was in the same spot when another court order forced her to move. This time she was accused of trespassing on a construction site. After she ignored her order, the order, her possessions were placed in the street and she was moved while sitting in her lawn chair to the sidewalk opposite the museum. When asked by a reporter for the Associated Press why she was opposed to the museum, Smith reasserted her sense that King wanted to serve the poor. And that is exactly what the Lorraine was doing when it was closed and she was evicted. For Smith, the Lorraine and King's legacy were being desecrated. This sacred ground, she said, is being exploited. 
Over 20 years have passed since the second forced move. Jacqueline Smith is still there. Smith maintains this protest vigil, urging visitors approaching the museum not to go inside. <coughs> Excuse me. The museum and the neighborhood gentrification that has accompanied it, she avers, has destroyed the area by making it unaffordable to longtime residents like herself. The whole neighborhood was now reserved for tourists. It was turning into Disneyland. Even in Memphis's unrelenting late summer sun, Smith stands at her corner opposite the museum behind two tables filled with copies of newspaper articles relating to her eviction. And this is what you see at 19 years, 202 days, keeping up this protest. In front of one of the tables is a banner with a large counter tracking the years and days since I began, she says, I began my personal protest to speak on behalf of the disadvantaged and displaced. Beneath the statement is a website where the tourist who likely hadn't bargained on this being part of the excursion can go to learn more about Smith's efforts. Smith's website, fulfillthedream.net, presents a timeline of King's life, but largely focuses on Smith's arrest and vigil and the museum, museum's short-sightedness and crass devotion to the tourist's dollar. The site does not mince words. The National Civil Rights Museum has from day one considered the ghoulish needs of the mass tourist market greater than the real need to educate and inform. This image is from, I again took from the web, from 19 years, 202 days. When I went there, it was at 23 years, 224 days. That was three years ago. Jacqueline Smith is still there. In many places throughout the website, Smith invokes religious language and et equates the museum's work as a desecration of a sacred space. Indeed, she faults the entire project for how it goes about the work of recording civil rights history, wondering aloud if this is the best use of a nation's memory. She says the National Civil Rights Museum exists to educate the public about the history of the civil rights movement and to promote civil rights issues in a proactive and nonviolent manner. Sadly, it fails to live up to these ideals. The truth is that the museum has become a Disney-style tourist attraction, which seems preoccupied with gaining financial success rather than focusing on real issues. All in all, the greatest criticism of the museum is that it dwells heavily on negativity and violence. Surely the underlying signals must, must portray hope and nonviolence. With one exception, the museum does not recognize Smith or her protest. It invests in the seriousness and integrity of its educational work and is equally determined to honor King and his legacy, as it is, is, it is equally determined to honor King and his legacy, as it is to telling the larger story of civil and human rights struggles in the United States and beyond. The museum does acknowledge Smith's presence, however, on the frequently asked questions page for the museum's website. You will find, who is the protester outside? Her name is Jacqueline Smith, and she has protested the museum since ground was broken in 1987, though she has never been inside the museum. Even though the museum recognizes Smith's protest, if only barely, her vigil tells us something valuable about the production of history, the sanctification of certain experiences over others, and the interplay between an individual and an institution. Here, a single person with a particular set of memories and a determination to remember a figure of such importance like King, in a specific way, finds herself facing an institution with a public commitment to remembrance that has become her horror making heritage, Louisiana. By any account, the southern heritage tourist trade is booming, as cities and states increasingly recognize the consumptive power of the black dollar. The attention to this market is intense. In 2005, a museum a year was opening in Montgomery, Alabama. That same year, the Alabama Bureau of Tourism and Travel released the Alabama, Civ Alabama Civil Rights Museum Trail, a 24-page booklet guiding tourists to the state's main sites of racial shame and remembrance. Indeed, Alabama may have been on the leading edge of state-sponsored efforts to remember the civil rights past. In 1983, it was the first state to distribute a black heritage guide. Currently, the Alabama Civil Rights Trail is one of 16 state trails featured on the Sweet Home Alabama website. From this site, you can also navigate to, among others, the Food and Wine Trail, the Hank Williams Trail, the Civil War Trail, and the West Alabama Hunting and Fishing Trail. In the 30 years since Alabama public produced its first Black Heritage Guide, African American her heritage trails are found throughout the country. They predominate in the southeast, but are also to be found as far north as Boston and Martha's Vineyard. The jewel in the crown of these trails is the brand new, relatively new now, Louisiana African American Heritage Trail. 
The official history of the, of the Louisiana African American experience debuted in February 2009. It is in your pocket and at your fingertip, literally. A very basic internet search will take you to the website for the state of Louisiana's African American Heritage Trail, a site titled A Story Like No Other. After following a few links, you can download the Like No Other smartphone app. I have it right here on my phone. And you're ready to explore Louisiana's rich black history. However, before you start using the app to browse various heritage sites, read capsule histories of these sites, bookmark them in a separate file, and then map them in order to create a personalized itinerary, two performers set the stage for understanding and appreciating uh, the unique nature of black Louisiana's heritage. When you navigate to a story like no other, a splash page opens up with a shot of a lonesome, unpaved country road at some point in the early fall or late winter. Two musicians amble in from, in from the left side of the screen, their laconic and swaying pace keeping time with the thrum of crickets and cicadas hidden among the brown grasses and, and thicket of trees covered with Spanish moss in the distance. While the harmonica player calls us to attention with his keening yet comforting playing, the guitar sings. <laughs> A governor like no other A millionaire like no other A boy cat like no other Like no other. When it comes to soul food, my brother, it's like no other. A story, yes, a story like no other. A governor like no other, a millionaire like no other, a boycott like no other, and a coach like no other. And the music, sweet music, music like no other, when it comes to soul food, my brother, it's like no other. A story, yes, a story like no other. While the guitar player sings, performing in blissful rapture, a montage of images scrolls across the right side of the screen. The viewer sees politician PBS Pinchback, millionaire Madam C.J. Walker, Scenes from the 1953 Baton Rouge bus boycott, legendary college football coach Eddie Robinson, musicians playing in a public square, and soul food matriarch Leah Chase. In short, the introduction is all about celebrations and excellence. There's nothing wrong or even, or even offensive about these entities. In fact, they make perfect and compelling sense in the context of travel tourism. But as the tourist begins to navigate through the website on the smartphone app and assembles the planned route through the state, what kinds of history will the tourist encounter? Will the memories of the long neglected black voice be experienced, or will some state-sponsored version of history rule the day? Will there even be a distinction between the two? The stakes here are considerable. Though conceived by public historians who were dedicated to getting the story right, the Louisiana African American Heritage Trail was brought to fruition because of the financial boon that could accompany, accompany it. Billions of dollars were at stake or could be realized, I should say. Even though potential market economies helped to justify the trail's creation, the public historians who conceived of Louisiana's African American Heritage Trail remained committed to reconstructing the African American experience as accurately as possible. As they began to develop their plan for the trail, they decided to focus upon five core themes, plantation life, the history of Louisiana's free people of color, the Civil War and Reconstruction, that's one, Jim Crow, and the struggle for civil rights. Organizing blacks' experience through these themes made natural sense given the prominent role these events, places, or people played in Louisiana's life, but the historians remained concerned about how to excavate, literally and figuratively, the African-American past, when so much of it had been ignored or silenced. With this challenge in mind, they set out to find those sites throughout Louisiana that were telling the state's hist history faithfully. They had mixed success. There were those, like the River Road Museum, a small, essentially one-person operation that presented the history of African Americans in Donaldsonville, a key waypoint along the Mississippi River, that's River Road, in sugarcane country. 
The River Road Museum survived on a shoestring budget while seeking support from the state government and the National Park Service for, among other things, its community garden that simultaneously recreated what slaves would have planted around their cabins to sustain themselves and provided produce for the local present-day population. The suggested donation inside the museum door is $5. The Heritage Trail historians also found plantations that catered to a paying tourist economy that were slow if not flat out resistant to incorporating slavery and its horrors into the site's narrative, into their site's narratives. Oak Alley Plantation explained its resistance in, to unsettling narratives in romantic and financial terms. According to historian Jessica Adams, Oak Alley owner Zeb Mayhew believes, quote, Oak Alley, visit Oak Alley visitors for the most part are looking for a gone with the wind brand of fantasy. They come for the hoop skirts, the grandeur, and the elegance. This kind of attitude greatly frustrated the state historians who were looking for sites that were prepared to deal with a fuller historical narrative instead of a fantasy. I had never been to a plantation before. Visiting relics of a simpler, quote, simpler era never appealed to me. My reluctance was predictable, of course, as anyone who isn't a romantic about the antebellum South would understand. But here I was on the Evergreen Plantation, a major stop in the Louisiana African American Heritage Trail. About a dozen of us gathered on, for the walking tour. If I had to guess, most people were there for the big house. I was interested in, the, in, this, in this as well, but I was mainly there to see the other buildings. It so happens that Evergreen Plantation has the largest collection of original buildings from an, the era of antebellum plantation farming, over 35 buildings, in fact. The big house, the gardens, the pigeon air, it's where the pigeons were kept that you would actually dine on. The big house, the gardens, the pigeon air, all of these places were interesting or lovely, but Morris was a collection of still life structures or settings. The kitchen, however, was mesmerizing. Not for the three shelves of darky collectibles, mammy salt shakers and such, that had no relationship to the antebellum past, but were carefully displayed all the same, but for the way the tour guide explained the daily obligations of the slaves who fixed the meals for the residents in the big house. The ghosts began to arrive at that moment when the guide demonstrated how the heavy pots would rest over the burning wood, how the cooks would use long iron rods to manipulate these pots, how they rose every day, day in and day out, to sustain those who shackled their lives. I was dumbfounded, though, when we moved from the, slave, when we moved from the kitchen toward the slave cabins. There they were, ominously silent, down a haunted allay of oak trees, absolutely still, waiting for us. Much to my surprise, I was very hesitant to go down that path. I felt I was trespassing. I was going where I did not belong. But I also admit to being confused because there, these weren't my people. My people were from North Carolina and Virginia. They weren't from Southern Louisiana. The presence of the figurative and psychological connection, however, could not be denied. These were my people. History told me as much, even though history also told me that reducing a radically diverse population into a people was intellectually lazy. Nevertheless, before I walked up the steps to the first slave cabin, I silently apologized for paying $20 to buy a ticket to the, planta to the plantation and to pay for the upkeep of the house, the big house. I apologized to all of them, Henry White, Apollon, Ben Lewis, Joshua, John, Edmund, Tom Brown, Manuel, Sterling, Crouch, Moses, Fleming, Alfred, Robert, Terry, George, Benjamin Harrison, Nelson, Baptiste, Abraham, Ambrose, Squire, Aaron, Jackson, Anderson, Tom, Henry, Ben, Jean-Pierre, Joe, Pierre, Linhen, Ursul, Suzanne, Genevieve, Fanny, Chloe, Dunka, Sabelle, Hector, Ebony, Will, Ursine, Clara, Jacques, Germaine, Alexis, and two children unnamed, all of whom were listed as property at the slave cabin door. Considering the distant silence that accompanied the display of porcelain grotesqueries in the kitchen, the cost per person of maintaining the big house, which actually was still was held as private property and occupied in the off season, the fact that I was the only black person on the tour and that some of our group arrived as part of a day-long private bus tour moving them from one plantation to another, I found myself taking deep breaths, trying to gird myself for whatever whitewashed narrative the tour guide was surely about to offer 
about the slave cabins. The guide, however, surprised me. This is hallowed ground, she said. We don't know enough about the people who worked this land and who lived in these cabins. We do know, however, that they were skilled farmers and craftsmen and, they, and that they built everything we have seen today. What I found to be remarkable in that moment, as it turns out, was a noted shift in the narrative a visitor to Evergreen would have heard just a few years earlier. Then visitors to Evergreen would still have seen the slave cabins, but the tour's focus would have been entirely on the plantation house and the other white occupied spaces. The kitchen, now a site, in, this is a, kitchens are outhouses, by the way, they are not in the, in the houses. The kitchen, now a site where one learns how slaves fed the plantation, was then merely the place where the owner, the current day owner, hosted dinner parties. Granted, the mammy figurines remain, but one can imagine they played a more interactive role during the dinner parties and in their perched gargoyle-like silence one finds today. My tour guide didn't reference them at all. There's no doubting that visitors still come to Evergreen primarily to see the plantation house, and it is likely that they, they may see the slave cabins as something more akin to spectacle than a site of violent subjugation and loss. The tour guide's changing narrative, however, is a reflection of an evolving sensibility about how to tell stories about the black past. But telling a new story about an old place was not a simple matter of updating a script based upon new evidence or, and interpretations. For example, in recent years, curators at Baton Rouge's Magnolia Mound Plantation have been chipping away at older, more traditional narratives that focus their attention on the plantation house. As late as 1999, for example, tour guides at the Magnolia Mound Plantation declared that the site did not have any records about the slaves who had worked on the plantation. In the place of this absence, the guides developed a narrative about the Magnolia Mound slaves. They fleshed out the story, as it were, based on secondary literature about Louisiana sugarcane plantation slave system, not Magnolia Mound system, but generally Louisiana system. At the turn of the 21st century, and under the leadership of a new manager, who also happened to be a trained archaeologist pursuing a more nuanced engagement with the past, the Magnolia Mound Plantation script had been aggressively rewritten. Previously, visitors to the site only had a structured tour of the plantation house and the kitchen house. The rest of the outside grounds were open to visitors, but without curatorial guidance. In 1998, a slave cabin was relocated to the Magnolia Mound site. The original cabins had not survived, but it was not yet woven into the guided tours of the plantation. In the new Magnolia Mound script, slaves' presence became marked throughout the tour. Every room in the big house, for example, was a site where free and slaves interacted. The tour now continued outside of the plantation house, and the slave cabin was incorporated into the broader narrative about life on the plantation. Archaeological digs had unearthed an entire narrative about how slaves lived at Magnolia Mound. Furthermore, extensive genealogical research, research projects at the turn of the century, into the 21st century, revealed that there were extensive records, in fact, about the enslaved people who lived at Magnolia Mound. Now, tour guides could talk about Josephine, Bathsheba, Abram, Fanny, Dick, Harry, and another 45 slaves who lived in 16 cabins in the slave quarters. This did not mean that the interpretive challenges had been surmounted, nor could they ever be. In truth, the difficult work was, barely, was only just beginning. Now that Magnolia Mounds enslaved people had names, and now that the curators had a better sense of how they lived, the curators' commitment to understanding and projecting the, entire, the complete story of Magnolia Mound only intensified. Curators made sure to incorporate the restored slave cabin into the tour, but also made sure that they framed the cabin in a particular way. In a lesson plan targeting students anywhere from third to twelfth grade, the opening line of the tour became a serious call to remembrance. We are about to enter the slave cabin. This is a real slave cabin. What does real mean? People really lived here, not fake, nonfiction. So we need to be respectful when we are in this place, no joking or wisecracks. Another serious matter curators continue to struggle with is the fact that Magnolia Mound, now a 16-acre site, one six. Used to, used to encompass 950 acres. The size of the site isn't so much a problem, but the research staff is now certain that the private homes abutting the property of the Magnolia Man Plantation, nearest to the restored slave cabin, also happen to be built upon slaves' unmarked graves. Perhaps the most powerful site of mortal anonymity in Louisiana, however, is found on the edge of downtown 
New Orleans and Treme, the city's sixth ward. Often referred to as the long time or historic home to the New Orleans' black population, there are several sites related to the black past within blocks of each other. But it is a small memorial that is outside the church that speaks loudest to the horror of absence. At first glance, the memorial looks like a small garden with a curious set of crosses planted in it. But with time, it becomes clear that a powerful force is at work. There are multiple small crosses of various size and design planted along the tropical grasses. Looming over them is a massive cross. It leans at a 45 degree angle and appears to have been made out of a ship's anchor chain. Tangled in this cross are half a dozen slave shackles, some intact, some broken. This site is the Tomb of the Unknown Slave. Dedicated on October 30th, 2004, the St. Augustine community created this site to honor the memory of the nameless, faceless, turfless Africans who died in Treme. More than this, however, the shrine was a call to remember all slaves who lie buried in unmarked graves. The tomb's memorial plaque acknowledges that the tomb tells a story that is as boundless as its subjects are nameless. And I quote here. You can see the plaque off to the side right here. There is no doubt that the campus of St. Augustine Church sits astride the blood, sweat, and tears of some of the mortal remains of unknown slaves from Africa and local American Indian slaves. In other words, the tomb of the unknown slave is a constant reminder that we are walking on holy ground. Thus, we cannot consecrate this tomb because it is already consecrated by many slaves in glorious deaths, bereft of any acknowledgement, dignity, or respect. As a site of historical performance, the Tomb of the Unknown Slave is a powerful marker of loss, absence, injustice, and cruelty. Although based in historical fact, it is in the end a figurative assertion of what makes us who we are as a nation, even if it only happens to be stop number two in a story like no other. Thank you. <laughs>